So just real quick, my name is Susan Gallo. I'm the executive director at Maine Lakes. We are a statewide lake conservation organization. Lake Smart is our flagship program that works with homeowners. We support lake associations. We do outdoor education programming through our Lakes Alive program, and we work on advocacy in Augusta and sometimes in DC. So please visit us at mainelakesociety.org to learn more. Uh, today we have with us Ben Pryorles. He is um, the Main Lakes, Main Lakes, Main Lake Science Center Research Director uh, at LEA in Bridgeton. It's a great facility if you haven't been over there. He, Ben, grew up in, on, I'll just give you his brief bio. Ben grew up on Long Island and in New York and spent many summers visiting Maine. Uh, he had a, his family had a place on Sand Pond in Denmark, which he and his brother maintain that camp today. I just learned today that Ben and I were uh, classmates at Cornell in the mid 80s. So that was kind of fun to learn. He had got his bachelor's there and since that, and then he went on to get his master's and a PhD in marine sciences from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's been active, actively involved in all sorts of lake uh, projects, but he focuses on phytoplankton, microbial ecology, and general water quality issues, including um, such things as eutrophication. When he's not studying aquatic systems, Ben enjoys sailing on and swimming in lakes, and he plays ultimate and is also uh, and also performs music. So he's well-rounded. Uh, he has a lot of information to share with you. And hopefully, let's see, I will stop sharing my screen, Ben, if you want to um, open your video. Hello. Hi, Ben. There you go. Let me share mine. And I will, I'll say, say goodbye, but I'll, I'll be listening, but I'm turning. You'll be there. Off. Don't leave me. I'm here if you need me. Okay. Well, uh, this is very odd to talk to a screen and not to a lot of people, but I know you're there. Um, looks like getting on towards our 100. So very exciting to do this uh, for my first time, actually. Um, so here I am, I'm at the Main Lake Science Center, uh, Lakes Environmental Association. And I wanna to talk to you today about a small project that we embarked on last summer, last year, that had to do with uh, using optical brighteners as a way to track septic systems in lakes or the effluent of septic systems in lakes. And so that's just the basic idea. Let me see if I, my first slide will advance. Come on, there we go. So everybody was introducing themselves in their pond. And as Susan said, I grew up, spent a lot of time growing up on this lake. This is Sand Pond in Denmark, Maine. So it's, it's my home lake, but as research director at Lakes Environmental Association, I've certainly started to feel like the, the other 40 lakes that we uh, work on, and in fact, many more of the lakes around Maine are part of, part of my, uh, my posse. So uh, it's, uh, it's hard to really put to one, but this would be the one I guess I come back to. So let me just say that uh, the little short version of the story today is that, um, we, there's a technique to use optical brighteners that are found in detergents as a way to uh, uh, look for, survey for uh, septic system, septic systems that are impacting lakes. The material works its way through. If, if a septic system is failing, it works its way into the lake. And we used community volunteers to sample. And we discovered 30 to 40% of our sites of several of over a hundred sites uh, last summer detected positive for optical brighteners. What that means is still yet to be determined. We will be fo hopefully following up on this project in the days or in the, this coming year. Um, uh, but I'll tell you about that at the end. So there's the, this short, short version of the story. So you can all go home now. And I'm actually so excited that people are here. It's so beautiful out now. Um, I'm amazed that folks are interested in, and signing on. So very, very good to see you. Well, this, uh, <laughs> I, I put this up this January when I presented this material to uh, uh, at our researcher retreat. And uh, I met it 
really in regards to this topic. Uh, but of course, these days, um, this may be even appropriate for what's going on. But uh, as they say, with uh, death and taxes is nothing, uh, this is another thing that's cer a certainty in life. <laughs> and you have to deal with it. So what are the ways to deal with human waste? Um, well, probably many people around the, the country uh, use, are part of a centralized waste water treatment plant. And these are facilities that take the combined uh, waste from many, many households um, and treat it through sometimes multi-step treatments to remove the pathogens and the nutrients and the material that would harm harm the uh, receiving water. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Susan, do you know if that's visible? Maybe not. Well, over it's okay. Uh, over in the right, there's you can see discharge going into that river or stream. Um, and so usually at that point, assuming it, the plant is operating okay, it's nice and clean and uh, or relatively clean and, and doesn't harm uh, the uh, water quality of, of the receiving water. For people living in, in Maine, many of, many of the households, and particularly households that are uh, surrounding lakes, use something called these, uh, I need to move this out of the way, the uh, uh, on-site individual wastewater treatment systems, which kind of sounds a bit like one of those euphemisms that George Carlin would talk about, but it's septic systems. And they are, they are made up of a, a septic tank and a leach field. And this is a very nice looking one, just going in brand new, um, pr pretty nice. Uh, let's see, oh yeah. So here is a diagram showing just a, a, an outline of how these systems work. Material comes from the home and it goes into this tank. And in this area of the tank, or of the system, solids settle out, and then the liquids move on through into what we call leach field or drain field, where there are perforated pipes or some sort of uh, way that the material gets diffused, spread out into the gravel and goes through the soil that's below. And it's at this point that uh, the material that we would rather not make it into the groundwater and in our surface water bodies gets absorbed. Uh, and, and remove and material removed before the water itself makes it on on through. So this is this is how we the basic idea. Of course, there's many different versions of these systems. Some have to be pumped, um, but that's uh, uh, this is the basic idea. And um, well, what do they remove? What is the, what are the things that we're worried about? This table uh, shows uh, from an EPA um, source looking at some, uh, some material which are considered problems. Went wrong way. Um, so on the left are the parameters, and I'm just focused on the parameters and the percent removal as it goes through one of these soil infiltration or, or leach fields. Um, BOD is um, biological oxygen demand, so it's basically organic matter, and it, these systems do pretty well, 90 to 98%. Total nitrogen, nitrogen is one of the nutrients that uh, relate to eutrophication. Uh, not as much tends to be removed by these systems, 10 to 40, um, and I'm sure there's a range. And of course, total phosphorus, phosphorus being the nutrient that we are most concerned about with, in lakes, uh, 85 to 95% can be removed. And then these bacteria, fecal coliforms, I'll talk, talk more about those, uh, now almost all of them are removed from these systems. <clears throat> Now, put that uh, diagram was showed, the, here's the basic diagram, but now put next to a picture of a lake shore, lake shore front. And that's the situation you have with many homes in Maine. Um, and the uh, citation I found that in 1990, over 50% of the homes had a septic tank or a cesspool system for treating their, their household waste. So we are concerned with uh, what, how these systems are working in the lakeshore zone. In most cases, everything's working fine and, and there isn't a problem. However, there are cases where this is not, not happening, they're not working properly. For instance, 
uh, material in the, in the septic tanks have filled up so much that, that there's no way for the water to, to make it through or, or for the solids to, the solids prevent the water from actually going into the leach field and it releases to the surface. There's blockages from roots over on the right. Um, so this is the concern um, and some, I showed you that early picture with a very nice new design, well-designed system. Some of our older properties on lakes have systems that weren't probably designed to code to today's code and don't work so well um, and may in fact be sending material almost directly to uh, the lake. So at this point, um, we're gonna introduce a short two question poll, I think. And Drew is gonna put it up there. So basically I'm just curious uh, and I think you can um, uh, just go ahead and answer for, I'll, I'll leave it for, what do we just leave it for a couple of, a couple of minutes? Is that what we're gonna do? First is, where is my leach field? Do you know where your, where your septic tank and your leach field are? 100%, very good. Everybody's, everybody's good. I wish that were the case for everybody around our lakes. And then we have a second question, I think, coming up. Yeah, so do you know when it was last inspected or cleaned? Leave that up for a minute or two. These are really important because those, those pictures of the, not, the, the systems that weren't working well are a product of them not being inspected or cleaned. So. Very good, so everybody, everybody here is on board. I don't, I'm preaching to the choir. But that is part of the, uh, the issue. So when they don't work well, here's an issue, an extreme issue, where the, on the right, you can see the leach field pipes. Uh, they're sticking out of the ground. It's eroded away so much that it's literally just dripping right out into a lake. And um, I have put together two different lake pictures just for effect. They're not the same system. But on the left is, uh, is, a, is a site on a lake um, uh, that, not in Maine, um, that had, you can see the algal growth and that had um, a septic system that wasn't working well. And, and it was coming up through the groundwater and fertilizing the, the algae uh, in, in the short, very shallow littoral zone. So the waste effluent, the septic system effluent, comes with, unless it's been treated properly, uh, potentially can introduce nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, and also pathogens. Uh, the bacteria, which are part of uh, our, bottle, our bodies that are shed, and viruses as well. And at this point, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, and everybody's gonna be sick of this picture, but this is the SARS-CoV-2 virus or a model of it. And I, I put it up just, I thought I would kind of bring this to the current day, current events, um, because people might ask about that. And uh, especially the, um, the, the la some of the information that's been out there suggests that the, uh, this, this virus does show up in the fecal matter of patients. Um, it is not clear, the research hasn't been done yet to say, is, is the material, is it can you get infected from it, from that pathway? Um, because mostly it's a, it's respiratory droplets transmission and not a waste to, to mouth. Uh, but there is some evidence from the SARS ep uh, epidemic in 2003 that suggests there could have been a pathway uh, for people to get that disease um, uh, through through the waste, <laughs> the, the fecal, the stool material, you know, waste material route. So jury's still out on whether that's possible with this, this virus. Um, but there are certainly studies that show viruses do survive in uh, waste um, material. Um, it's, they can survive in water for a certain amount of time. Um, so it's, 
we, we haven't done that material. I think we haven't done those tests or not us, but the tests have not conclusive yet. We are, um, we'll be waiting to see what they say. Uh, so caution still is advised, um, but best to have your systems working well because they will remove those, those uh, the longer these things stay in the waste systems, the better. All right. And unfortunately, we uh, here in Bridgeton, we're not immune to uh, diseases from, from waste, from uh, human waste. Um, we had a beach closure in Bridgeton um, a couple of years ago. And that was caused uh, by, well, there were two beach closures. One was actually a norovirus, which is slightly different from the SARS-CoV-2 virus in that it's, it, it's a different, it doesn't have an envelope. It actually lasts a little tougher, so it sticks around longer. Um, but we also had uh, closures due to the town testing for uh, fecal indicator bacteria like E. coli. These are, as I say, they're indicator bacteria. They're bacteria that are found inside mammals uh, that suggests that there's contamination and that there are other pathogens there present in the water and that somebody can get sick from that. They, you might not necessarily get sick from that bacteria itself. It's just an indicator. Um, so the town was measuring and they had to, and they had to close. And that was one of the reasons we uh, were interested in, in doing this project. Uh, and also the town had used optical brighteners, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, to test some of the streams, um, the stream that connects Highland Lake with Long Lake, Stephen Brook, Stevens Brook, and found high levels of the both fecal, the fecal indicator bacteria, E. coli, and optical brighteners. So this is what led us to this project. Using just using the fecal indicator bacteria, using E. coli, does say that there's potential contamination, but it doesn't necessarily say where it's coming from. And so there's something called fecal source tracking, which is a way to just identify where the waste material, what organism the waste material came from. And it could be from humans or it could be from something like geese shown in this picture. So there's a, a large number of techniques out there now to, to, to work this out. And, and some of them are, are more sophisticated and more accurate than others. Uh, particularly some of these molecular methods that can actually get to the genetic level and identify uh, this particular uh, pathogen came from a human or not. Uh, so I won't go into the, I'm not going to talk much about those at all. What I'm interested in are some of these simpler, slightly simpler chemical methods uh, that do the same thing. They, they in a way, they indicate um, material that may be present uh, from, from human consumption, uh, caffeine is one example, or present in some material that humans, something that humans do that leaves a signal. And in that case, we're talking about optical brighteners. And that's what this talk is about. So optical brighteners, these are the materials that are added to um, laundry detergents and to some papers, paper products like toilet paper that make things look whiter and brighter. Um, and there's, uh, a, again, a range of, of com range of compounds, but one of the interesting things about them is that they fluoresce. And you can see from this example, we have water and water plus tide on the right. And the tide has optical brighteners. Sorry about my phone going off. Um, and the, this is being lit by uh, uh, a black light, which is a UV light, and you can see it glowing. It's glowing is really what we call fluorescence. And this is a quick diagram for those of you who don't know what fluorescence is. Uh, it's the production, it's a, a substance which absorbs light, we call it, which is the excitation light. And in the case of the optical brightener diagram I just showed you, it's a UV light, uh, a near UV light. Um, the material, the optical brightener in the solution absorbs that light and produces a light at a longer wavelength, a blue light. And we call this the emission 
So we have the excitation light and the emission. That's just my 30 second description of fluorescence. And now, oops, let me see if I can stop my share. Hopefully I'm gonna do a little demonstration, hopefully just to show you that I wasn't Photoshopping anything. So I'm gonna do the same thing. Here's my beaker with water only. Hopefully you guys can see this. And then, oh, wait, I forgot to put on my safety glasses. <laughs> we can see it then, just so you know. Okay, good. Here's that glowing, hopefully you can see that blue yep. fluorescence, that's tied. I just added some more, it had started to fade on me, so I added a little more today. Now, so I remember I said liquids are, are what, are the, the laundry detergents like Tide. Um, and these things will actually attach, the molecules are, are designed to attach to particles too. And that's why they attach, when you use them to wash your clothes, it, the compounds stick to your clothes. And I think you might be seeing my shirt. And what it, what it does is it makes, because it's actually fluorescing and giving off a little more brightness, it makes things look whiter and brighter. Um, so now I'm gonna use a product that we're all near and dear to all our hearts. <laughs> uh, this is a product from Grove, the Grove, they have their bamboo paper. And there's not much happening. It's hard for me to see what's doing. Yeah, we can see that. And then look at that glow. So that is optical, uh, the optical brightener in the paper glowing. And this is just a black light. This is what it looks, looks like. You'll, I'll show you a picture. We use that in the analysis, so. All right, let me go back to sharing again. And there we go. So, so that's, that's the definition. I guess I can take these off. The definition of, or what optical brighteners are. And the idea is that if you have a system like this that's not doing well and it's not spending any time getting uh, infiltrated into the soils, material will come out into your lake or your receiving water body. And in, as I said, it, should, it potentially has nutrients and, and some pathogens in it, but it also has optical brighteners. And that was the goal is that we could look for these optical brighteners in the lake uh, and that would indicate to us that there, there was the potential for these other items in it as well. So one thing that came up uh, in, in other discussions with folks is, are these optical brighteners bad? I've had some people say, oh, well, I'm gonna use detergents that don't have any optical brighteners. And the compounds are, have been shown not to, there's, there's no harm from the compounds, particularly at the concentrations that we're, we're gonna be dealing with in the systems. I'm sure if you took the raw material uh, straight, you would probably not do you any, any good. But in the kind of concentrations we're talking about, there's plenty of other things that are, that are bad for you and it's, or the environment that we, we, so we don't really have to worry about optical brighteners themselves. I wanted to make sure that was clear that these are not, the problem, they're an indicator of a problem. So, well, that now, now the, the idea is, okay, because these things fluoresce, we can use a fluorometer, and that's, we're shown here as a fluorometer, and if it's set up right with the excitation light, in this case, it, for those who like uh, the numbers, 365 nanometers, which is near UV, and the light comes in on that, what looks like a down arrow, comes in from one side, and it, 90 degrees to it, uh, the machine reads the emission wavelengths that blue or light at 410, 450 nanometers, which is what we can see in those glowing, glowing flasks. So seems pretty easy, right? We can just go out and grab a sample and measure it for optical brighteners. Well, maybe not. So natural water contains uh, colored material, tannins. Uh, we call this colored dissolved organic matter. Uh, and this gives the, the water a brown look to it, a bit like tea. Um, and certainly we have some of that in, in, our, in our lakes in, in our area. And there's plenty of lakes that are extremely colored. Um, 
And so what's, well, what's wrong with that? What's the problem there? Well, this material uh, kind of gets in the way. And I'm, this is a complicated figure. I'll, I'll walk you through it. Uh, so this is a special, this is the output from a special fluorometer that can produce a range of excitation light, a range of colored colors of excitation light going from the far UV all the way into here, this, this diagram showing up into the, into the blues and at the same time measure the emission at a range of colors or wavelengths. And this material, this was some uh, organic matter, natural organic matter. And the little box in the middle with OB in it is our, the range of excitation and emission for optical brighteners. And you can see it's not, not on the peak, but it certainly is where there's fluorescence from natural organic matter. So Houston, we have a problem. We can't, if, if we have a lot of colored organic matter, uh, how are we gonna measure the um, optical brighteners at the same time? Well, turns out there's a method uh, adapted in the reference there at the bottom where you take advantage of the difference in how these compounds get photo bleached. And what the technique does is get a reading then expose the samples to UV light. Again, that black light, just you can see that's the same black light I just showed you. Uh, and do that and then take a reading again, expose it some more and expose it at different, different lengths of time uh, and measure the response. Here's some of the raw data from a test I did where I have a sample and I added tide detergent to it to a certain concentration. And the samples were the NOM is natural organic matter and DI is deionized water, pure water. So that I had deionized water with Tide, I had natural organic matter on its own, and then three different concentrations of Tide with the natural organic matter. Uh, and what you're seeing here is just the relative fluorescence, it's that raw reading off of the fluorometer you, that I showed you a second ago versus time of UV light exposure going from zero to 15 minutes. Um, this is kind of hard to figure out because there's such different levels. Uh, you can see that the natural organic matter by itself and, and even with the optical brightener is um, very, much, very much higher than um, just the optical brightener in DI alone. But what I think you can notice is that um, when there's the op right away with the optical brightener in, in DI water, there's an immediate drop and then a kind of slow decay. And while you can't quite see it that well, the organic matter on its own, the darkest red, just looks more linear decay. Hey Ben, can I, I'm yeah. sorry, to, inter I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but um, for the attendees, there are two black boxes up on your screen, on your slides. Um, I don't know if you can see them, but they came after you stopped sharing and then started sharing your screen is when they popped up. Oh. So I didn't know if you wanted to oh, try. They're my, I guess are the, um, are they moving? Uh, no, yes, they are. Oh, are those your chat? Your yeah, box? how do I get oh, rid of those? Okay, if you could get them off the screen then. Um, I'm they, trying, I don't, I'm not sure how. <laughs> maybe just put them at the bottom. Okay. Sorry I think if that. you close them, there's a little X in the right hand corner, you can just close them. Mine doesn't. No. no. Okay. Uh, maybe I should be in, not in full screen? Uh, that would work. No, I, no. Think you, I don't think you can change that. But I think if you just move them down to the bottom, um, they'll get out of the way of blocking the, the screen, the images. Okay. Oh boy, sorry. Thanks no, for is, is the top Is the top bar visible? On uh, yep. That's, there's still a black bar blocking the title hmm. of the slide. Yeah, I'm having trouble. I mean, I can't get it. Let's see. How do I get rid oh. of it? Jason, now that one's back. Sorry, we've never, this is a new technical problem we yeah. haven't had before, so. Uh, maybe I should stop share and share again, or? Uh, try it. Somebody did that for me. I think Drew did that. Okay. No. No, I uh, think you can go back to it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a new one for me. I haven't, that's new. Oh, oh, good, they're gone. They're gone, okay. All right, sorry to interrupt you, thanks. You sure they're still gone? <laughs> still gone, yep, okay. we're good. All right. Um, 
so, so what I've done on this next slide, so we have the, the raw data. Now I've just done the data as you would see, um, uh, normalized it so that everything's on the same scale. So it's percent of initial fluorescence. Um, and so it's the same data, just, just kind of normalized this way. And again, it, it highlights that very rapid decrease in uh, fluorescence in the um, DI alone and, or, and optical brightener. And you can see at the top, there's the um, um, organic matter alone very, looking very linear. But we can actually put some numbers to this. And so what we do is we look at the change, how much it dropped at one minute and how much it dropped at 10 minutes. And that ratio, when the ratio is greater than 0.25, according to this, is this one method that, that we utilized, uh, we, we determine that optical brightener is present. And um, so the blues are the optical, the blue arrows are the optical brightener data and the reds are the um, natural organic matter. This was from Moose Pond nearby. Um, and you can see there's just a lot difference in the amount of change. And when I actually do those ratios for you, you can see that the um, Moose Pond water had a ratio of 0.18. And then all of the organic, all of the ones with optical brighteners uh, in it, with tide in it, um, had ratios that were greater than our, our threshold, so, which says, well, in this case, we would have detected um, the optical brighteners, uh, we would have called that sample positive for optical brighteners. Uh, we are not able to, we're not able really to quantify we, at this point, we just give a presence or absence kind of result. So again, this is this photo bleaching method as a way to determine optical brighteners when there's organic matter present. And this is meant to look crazy, but this is, this is what we ended up with our, our, our samples, uh, the kind of data that we had. And that, that line, the, the horizontal line is uh, the 0.25 threshold. So we had a range and we had a lot of variability uh, from repeat sampling uh, that I still not sure why we were getting that. It could be some um, degradation going on between samples, um, but we definitely had a mix of positives and negatives with figuring out where some, where some of that, when variability was enough to, to say, or, or little enough to, to say, yes, this is above the threshold or not. So as I said, in, in last summer of last year, we received a small grant from the Maine Community Foundation, and that was to, to run these samples, but also the, the point of it was to involve the community, the local community, uh, because we recruited volunteers, to collect water samples uh, at, um, around their uh, shores or wherever they wanted to, um, uh, whichever lake they wanted to, um, to return, bring the samples back to us um, from, from the lakes and we would run the optical brightener analysis uh, here in the lab at LEA. And here was the setup. You've already seen the fluorometer, but a very simple setup. We collect the, the data, and as I showed you the setup for the photo bleaching, uh, just do that in a box and time it uh, and reread it, read it at those uh, two different time points. Uh, we'd also run a, a standard, a known standard of that uh, tide solution, kind of just as a check that everything is working properly. So we did, a, uh, I thought a great, uh, we had a great participation rate. We had 40 volunteers in July and the July period was around the July 4th time and that was done intentionally because we thought well let's pick a time when there would probably be a lot of activity <laughs> in the households. Um, and in August and September we, we didn't get quite the same small time frame. We had people kind of hit it, hit it on a longer time range but we had, still had 20, 20 volunteers collect water samples for us. Uh, and we had nine different lakes. Uh, and here is a map of our area. Bridgeton is roughly in the middle there. And the dots, the uh, uh, uncolored, clear, well, the black and white dots are where there was no presence of optical brighteners. 
and the blue are where there was optical brightener present. So over 100 samples, roughly 33% of them had optical brighteners present, and that was in nine different lakes. We did it again in August. We had uh, not quite as many samples collected. It was harder to find people. People were leaving, leaving town, but um, and it was close to Labor Day, so we had a mix of busy and not so busy times, but um, we still had actually, in this case, 40, over 40% had optical brighteners present, eight lakes sampled, and we even resamp tested some sites that were positive, um, and those came out positive, some, about 11 of those came out positive again, so that was, that was interesting, and those certainly suggest that those might be sites to revisit and, and check. So I'm getting down to the, to the end here. I mean, that's the, the basic story. Um, we would like to continue this work in the summer. Um, we have uh, put in for, to get materials and equipment to measure E. coli using that, uh, the IDEX trays um, that are up there, the quanta trays. Those are a, a uh, color, a dye, and a fluorescent technique to measure coliforms and E. coli specifically. Um, so we hope to be able to do that in conjunction with these optical brighteners tests. Um, because just because we're seeing the optical brighteners, while it, it certainly suggests there's an, it, there's an issue, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's septic system uh, waste for sure. We would love to be able to confirm that we have the presence of waste using this um, the FIB fecal indicator bacteria tests. Another thing is that we were able to do two time periods, but uh, we there's certainly plenty of variation in space and time that we would love to examine, um, maybe at a shorter time scale or after uh, rain rain events. Um, there's 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 plenty of more that that could be done. Um, there's some. Uh, potential uh, materials that might, um, I've, been told, I've been told that there's some thought that some uh, sunscreens might have compounds which fluoresce. So if our, if our testers were wearing a lot of sunscreen when they collected, could they have contaminated the samples? We'd love to, love to follow up on that. Um, maybe we could use, get some other source tracking techniques done, maybe not by us, but by someone else if we had to. Um, this all works when when there is uh, this indicator in the system. So that certainly a camp that uh, doesn't have a lot of toilet paper and doesn't have a lot of uh, laundry detergent, they don't have a, a washing machine, that might not be a way to, to track that, that system. But we're, uh, we're excited sort of the potential of this. Um, last, there would be the, um, I think go back to what I talked about and how these septic systems work, and they are dependent on uh, soils doing a lot of the work. The material has to infiltrate the soils. The it, um, materials absorb, uh, adhere to the soil particles. Um, so having the right soils where you have your septic system is important. And there's uh, a range of there's a data out there on on soil the soil surveys data that indicates what, what soils are what, how good they are for, how suitable they are for septic systems uh, in all, all around the state. So we might be able to apply those when we have, uh, as a way to, to focus our attention on certain areas, either where we've seen signals or to, to look for areas where we think we might, might focus our attention with the optical brightener and the E. coli, the E. coli tests. So I'll end with my home lake again. This time, the first was a sunrise. This is our sunset picture, of course. And um, I hope this has been interesting and I am gonna end it there. Again, we, we had a really interesting time, good participation with, with the funding by the Maine Community Foundation. We were excited for that. Um, great participation from our community members. And um, I think the results are, are intriguing and we definitely wanna follow up and. I will be happy to answer questions if I can. Great, thanks Ben. That was a really interesting um, information and it's kind of crazy that those 
you use a detergent thinking that your shirt's getting white and it's really just an illusion. It's yeah. still gray and dingy and gross and you just think it looks white. You say, oh, everything's great. It's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, we do have quite a few questions. Um, okay. There's a couple of them that revolve around um, sort of whether or not if whether or not you can test us, you know, a specific system when you're pulling these, if you're pulling them in front of a house, sort of what are the chances that it's that house or that septic? And then also along that lines, I think this is part of the same question, would be how long do they last in water and how far do you think they disperse from their source, if yeah. assuming they're coming from septics? All the questions that we want to ask our follow up with for this season. Yeah, yeah no. Um, those are wonderful questions, and I think we don't have an exact answer. Um, all it's mostly driven by groundwater, the, how the groundwater is making it through where, where it's coming out. So, so the it's has to do with if you have a very significant uh, uh, isolated source, um, and the material is uh, the septic system effluent is making it right through there, then then our, our technique would be, and we sampled enough locations, say a transect along the shore, found a hot spot. Um, it's, it's a little hard to do real time. There are field fluorometers that you could measure fluorescence in the field, uh, but doing the photo bleaching technique might be a little harder to do. I don't know, um, hadn't thought about that, but with enough samples, you could possibly identify an individual system, but really, and that's not what we're trying to do. I think we're just trying to get a sense of where there might be problems um, and bring it to the attention of, of people who should be, uh, who will take care of a town, you know, municipal officials um, and let them kind of deal with that. And, we, and that's what we have done is presented our information to the towns. Um, and um, because really for a specific system, you can use a dye test, sort of the same thing. It'd be a fluorescent material that you flush down your toilet and wait for it to come up and then you then you can say yeah that system is the the one i suppose if there's you know an obvious slushy or mushy area where some 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 leach fields are so badly clogged and not working that you'll actually have standing water and then maybe that kind of evidence would be uh would, would make it clear um mm -hmm. how long they last uh again they are the materials do photo bleach pretty easily that that data shows you when it when when they're hit by uv light sunlight which which is in sunlight they're going to decay over time um, now when they're in water there's some protection because some absorbance of uv by the by the water but they will they should break down oh pretty pretty quickly i was actually when i went into this it's it's kind of funny i i kind of didn't even believe it myself i said oh we'll never see a signal and so i was actually surprised because I thought, you know, as soon as it came out of the maybe the groundwater, it would be it would be it would break down, but but apparently it didn't. Um, did I answer? But there was one more. Oh well. So the other question, big question. Um, Whitney King and I had this discussion the other day that, you know, that there's a there's a residence. How long does it stay? The material stay uh, when it's in a darkened uh, septic leach field. Um, there's no light there, so um, that that there's the potential for it to stick around for a while. And what we're seeing is maybe from long ago. I don't know. So there may be um, we may be seeing optical brighteners that are kind of working their way through slowly from a from a system that isn't necessarily in bad shape, um, and and we're not getting any any of the nutrients or pathogens, which is why us measuring that second level with the with the bacteria e coli and even nutrients we'll be able to do that soon um will will enhance this method great um a couple other well i'll say it's um 4 we try to wrap up at 4 45 so oh, sorry. <laughs> that's okay that's all right um so people kind of start to drop off now so i um won't ask any more questions but like i said prior that we will um we will save the questions we'll send them to ben and um they won't be exhaustive answers but they'll be um 
uh, hopefully he can shed some light on the questions that you had. There's definitely been a lot of questions about people wanting to participate or I'm sure there are people who are ready to send you samples. So yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, we're not, we don't, <laughs> I should say we're not ready to go quite yet on those yeah. uh, projects, but um, well, when you are, help. yeah, and it's when not you are, I think there's a huge um, audience out there of people who are interested in this. So uh, I'll just share my screen. Well, where, Pardon me, I'll share my screen real quick just to wrap up and say, um, first of all, thank you to Ben for uh, the presentation and great information. Uh, next week, I don't know why, my screen does not like to move forward. Next week, thank you all for participating or for listening and for asking questions. Next week, we'll be hearing from Eric Topper at Maine Audubon about native plants and Lake Smart Landscaping. If you are like what you heard today and you wanna know more about Maine Lakes, we are a membership organization, so visit our website. We'll send out the recording to everybody uh, after this is complete in the next couple of days, along with uh, some more answers to your questions. And then uh, everybody just right after the webinar, there's a very short five question evaluation. It'll only take you uh, less than a minute to fill out. So please do that if you have a second. And um, thanks so much for joining us and hope to see some of you next week. And again, thank you, Ben, for the presentation. It was a pleasure. Thanks everyone for attending.